pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Thank you, for Pete. There was another reading. Could you put back that we have here, and I, I wanted it to be here because I'm going to talk about this, is a prayer, if you look at it carefully. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. There are three parts in this prayer. The first thing he talks about is the most important thing, is love. You know, without love, we're nothing. We can have knowledge, we can, have, we can do a lot of activities as Christians, evangelism, mission, but without love, we know that we're nothing. But he says it should abound. Not only it should abound, but it should abound with intelligence and discernment. You know, when I was studying a long time ago, <laughs> classical Greek, Attic, Ionic Greek, different classical Greek at the University of Geneva, we, we, we came across this language of love in you know, the Greek writers, you know, agape, you know, uh, phileo, uh, storgeo. Uh, we came across this language and we didn't think anything of it uh, because the Greeks <laughs> used those words all the time. Very important because when we find these words in the New Testament, they take on a whole new meaning. It's not enough for, for people to talk about love. What do you mean by that? I mean, there are a lot of movies that talk about love. A lot of books talk about love. A lot of people talk about love. But what do you mean by that? Is it what God means? Is it what Jesus means? Or is it something else? Words uh, mean nothing. They mean nothing unless they're, they're uh, in the context of what God is trying to teach us, to show us. In Romans 5, Paul says that God proves his love. How? Does he just say, I love you? I feel for you? He proves his love because he gave his life for us when we were enemies, when we were sinners. I'll now I understand what love means. And, and we have to read the words in the context. If we don't do that, it doesn't mean anything, basically. It can mean whatever we want, whatever this writer or that writer meant. That's why we need the Bible. And you could take a word out of the Bible and you, if you don't place it in the context, understand what God is telling you, it really doesn't, it doesn't mean anything outside. Do we have to be harsh, unkind, or even, hopefully not, aggressive towards those who are not in the faith? Can we be friendly and still tell the truth? To people? Can we be, can we have a friendly behavior? Can we help out? Can we serve? Can we pray even for those who don't believe at all like us and still tell them the truth? That's what the Christians are able to do. That's a unique perspective. I don't think it's the perspective of the world so much. Now the perspective of the world might be you are friendly, but don't tell people the truth. Don't tell them they need to change. Tolerate whatever they do. That's not the biblical perspective. The per biblical perspective is not either that you tell people, you know, what they need to do, they need to repent, and you're unfriendly, you're harsh, you're unkind. No, that is not the biblical perspective. So he talks about abounding in love. But he noticed that he says that this abounding in love, it's love is it's dynamic, it grows. Abounding means growing, developing, progressing in love. I hope I love more and better than I do now than I did a year ago or 10 years ago as I grow in the Christian faith. I hope so. I hope I can learn today something that will help me love better. Because why do we have all these teachings in, about love, 1 Corinthians 13 and all? Just to, to read a text and say, yeah, that's what love is. Or is it so that we can better understand it and we can grow? in it. Love is something we grow in. 
It's not just a commandment. It's a state of being. It's the way I think, the way I feel, the way I speak, the way I act. It's, it's all I need to be loving with all my being. Whether it's towards God or towards people, towards my neighbor. But you notice that he talks about love abounding, but also he mentions something important that we need knowledge. And we need discernment. Or spiritual discernment, depending on the translation. That's what I've been saying. Am I talking about love the way Plato talks about it? I could talk to you about Plato's way of looking now. So where is this knowledge coming from? What is this knowledge we need? I think it's the knowledge that comes from the Word. Can I talk about love without going to the Word? Just like that? Whatever I want it to mean? No. It's the Word that teaches me what love is. And especially it's the Word as, it, as, it, as we see it in the life of Christ, who is called the Word, the Logos. When I look at the life of Christ and what he did and how he treated people and all of that, I learn about love in a tremendous way. So this love is something we need to learn about. We need to gain knowledge. And the more we gain knowledge, the more we grow in that love. And the more we grow in that love, then the more we have impact of people around us. The more we actually are light and salt. This is really the teachings of Jesus Christ. We cannot be salt and light without that element. Love. It has to abound. It has to abound in intelligence and in discernment. That's what he tells us here. Now, all of that that he's said in, in that verse that you have in front of you, notice that it's a prayer. It's not teaching. It is teaching, but it's a prayer. And I have an interesting question I ask myself. Whenever I pray, what is the thing I ask God? What do I pray about? We pray a lot about sick people. That's good. We pray a lot of people in difficulty, in pain. But that's not what he's doing here. He's praying that these Christians in Philippi can grow in love. And I would like us to go home today and find a time that we can talk to God and ask for this church to grow in love. Imagine if we grow in love what we'll be able to do. Imagine the impact on this area and beyond when our love abounds. Why do I say that? Because abounding love the way God wants it is not something common. It's something quite rare in this world. Quite rare. Quite, we see the fruits of that. We see the result of that. So when we can pray on like that, you know what God will do? He will do it. Paul is not just teaching us something. He's praying in a prison in Rome, in Rome, put in prison by a murderer and a liar. Who is that? Nero. Nero, a murderer because he murdered most of his family, and a liar because he accused the Christians to burn Rome when he actually did it. Paul doesn't care about that. He's in prison. What he cares about is that these Christians will grow in love because that's what's going to change the world. Nero will die. The Roman Empire will die. The legions will disappear. And none of that today. But Christ's message of love will remain. And he's the Paul who says in 1 Corinthians 13 that there are three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. And he says about love, it will never perish. It will always exist. Faith and hope will go. But love, because that's part of God. That's the main part of God. It will always remain. We can be sure of that. When we have love in our heart and we act upon love, we're doing really the will of God. You know, there's no difference between this prayer and the Lord's Prayer. There's no difference. Why is that? Because the Lord's Prayer, he's saying, your kingdom come. The rule of God, that's what kingdom is. How is the rule of God? How do you, where is the rule of God? I wonder. 
It's where people are living out the will of God. What is the will of God? Love. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then love one another. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he's praying about. He's praying about these things that are the most important. When Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, he doesn't talk about sickness, he doesn't talk about this, he doesn't about that. He talks about the Father. He talks about the will of God being done in our life. He talks about the kingdom of God being manifest through our life. That's what God is about. That's what he's talking about here. Now all of that leads to the second thing, so that you may approve what is excellent. We have different translations here. Some have prove. Some have approve. To approve in English, to approve is a very weak rendering of the word. The word is used technically for somebody, you bring that to that person something that looks like gold, gold or, or silver. And this person is able to tell you because he knows about it. This is real gold. This is fake gold. The word approve here is a word that means somebody who scrutinizes, examines something, and can determine what is fake from what is real. That's what he's talking about. So let's change a little bit that to approve or to be able to examine, scrutinize, to test something so that we know, we are able to understand and know what is excellent. Just like in English, excellent is what? Beyond the average. We need to be looking to be beyond the average as far as Christian life. It's not like I'm do, I'll do the minimum I can do for the Lord. Yeah, I'll pray. I'll attend services, but I don't want to do more. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 48? Be you therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. The goal is way up there. I, I'll probably never reach it. But I want to, to grow. He says, abound in love. I want to be closer to God. I want to be more. I want to really decide in my heart that I'm tired of sin. I'm tired of selfishness. I'm tired of lying. I'm tired of cheating. I want to be honest. I want integrity in my life. I want to speak the truth, and I want to be an encourager. I want to become more like God wants me to be, more like Jesus Christ. I want to be more determined in that. That's what excellent means. Paul says later on in chapter 4, everything that is noble, everything that is excellent, think about those things. Excellence. We are called to excellence. Not to mediocrity, not to the minimum, not to be satisfied. In fact, you read the chapter 3, you remember that in Philippians. Not that I have achieved the race, but I continue to run until I reach the goal and I receive the prize. Quite a challenge. It's very dangerous to reduce uh, what Christ is asking us to become. It's up there. It's a big mountain. And it's okay to know that we always have to progress in life. We'll never be up there, but we, we're looking for what is better, what is excellent. It cannot be anything else with God, who is perfect and excellent. That you uh, to may approve what is excellent. To be able to distinguish between, like I said, the person looks at the, is this real gold or not? This is the real stuff. This is not the real stuff. We need to be able to distinguish that. So we can be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Pure because the gold that has been examined, ah, it's pure gold. It's okay. And then the third point, so that we may be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Righteousness is simple to understand. It's right conduct, right behavior. Words are easy. Conduct and action is what tells who we truly are. Jesus said, and that was a prescription that was up there too, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. It's a pretty simple principle. We have it here. Our grapes gathered from thorn bushes, figs from thistles. 
Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Wow. Of course, the same teaching all over. James teaching in John chapter 15 with the vine. Stay attached to Jesus. And if you're to look, John 15, how do I stay attached to Jesus? It tells you five times from verses 1 through 7 how you stay attached to Jesus. You know how? You stay attached to his commands his teachings. Five times you can read it for yourself. He repeats it. You are pure by the words I have taught you. You are my disciple if you follow my commandments. I give you another command, a new commandment. Love one another. It's repeated by the Lord. We need to be attached to his teachings because this is, this is not fake. This is the real stuff. This is truth. We can be sure that what God says, when he speaks, he means it. We, we don't always understand it perfectly, that's true. But we should do all we can to understand it, and especially to practice what he's taught us. So like I said, this is a prayer. Can we go home, and can we be spending this week? You ask ourselves, what should I pray about? Well, I know this person is sick, this person needs this. I have this business going, I'm doing this work for God. I can pray for these things, but what is the first thing to pray about? What Jesus told us to pray about, what Paul is telling us to pray about. I want to pray that this congregation will abound, grow in love. I'm going to pray that this congregation will grow in knowledge and discernment. I'm going to pray that people, Christians, brothers and sisters in this congregation will be able to examine things and know the difference between right and wrong, between fake and true. I want to pray that we can have righteous behavior. It's greatly needed, it seems to me, in our world. It's greatly needed. That's our task. That's our calling as Christians. And without even having to mention that, like it says in Matthew 7, there is a judgment coming. Whatever happens this week or next week or the following week, let's remember there is a supreme judge up there who will sort it out and he will judge each one with righteousness. And each one will receive what he deserves, whether it's good or bad. And he really, he's the one who knows all the intricacies about that. That's why he says don't judge because we're not God. And if we think we're God, we, we, can, we can discern everything, it's going to be difficult. But if we rely on the word and we do our part to grow in these areas that he mentions, we'll be able to do a good job on this earth, the time that we're living here on this earth. We have a call. Usually, it's kind of part of how we do things. We have a call for those who have not come to Christ through faith, repentance, and especially baptism. And we need to do that. We need to call those of, the, of us who haven't done that. But I think also that we need to call all of us to a prayer life that can emphasize this aspect. So let's pray for each other. Let's pray for our church. The way he prayed. We can even just open up the, bo the book there. In Philippians 1, and just repeat exactly what Paul said. That would be okay. It's a great teaching on prayer. So I would like to encourage you to talk to God this way, the way the Apostle Paul talks to God. Pray for the same things. And when we do that, God can do amazing things. It's not in vain. Prayer is not in vain. Prayer is powerful. And this is the will of God, that we can be true witnesses. And the end of these verses it says, to the glory and praise of God. That's what we want. We want God to be glorified, praised, and loved. This is the end of the story in the book of Revelation even. That's the end of the story, the praises of God, the praises of the Lamb, when all enemies are dealt with. 
Well, all justice is done and everything is okay. That's what we're looking for. It's a great hope. We have a great hope. We have a hope of eternal life. If anyone among, among us needs to pray to God, let him do it, let her do it for sins. If anyone has not yet been immersed with Jesus in his death and resurrection, this is the day. If you have faith and you want to live a faithful life, don't wait tomorrow. Why? Tomorrow, we don't know if we'll have tomorrow. The day of salvation is today. So consider that. Come to Christ. Come to the Lord. Obey him. It's, it's time to do that if you haven't done that. But we'll praise God and we'll be ready to share.